Well, in preparation of Saturday night, let's welcome in. We got our Luke Thomas and our Brian Campbell. So guys live in Las Vegas right now, the main event will see top lightweight contenders really trying to settle their score in this epic trilogy. McGregor won the first meeting by a first round knockout back in September of 2014. So BC, what are some of the keys for McGregor this Saturday? Well, that's what we want to see. That's the big question coming in. McGregor has been so quiet in the build-up to this fight. Of course, they'll talk later today at the press conference. But we want to see what adaptations, if any, Conor McGregor could have given to his game in the six months since their second fight. The first time McGregor was stopped by strikes in his MMA career. We saw in that one a boxing stance from Conor looking to set up combinations with the 1-2, but very little outside of that. His reaction to the calf strike strategy of Poirier uh, was remedial at best. It immobilized Conor and it left him a sitting duck to get stopped in that second round. I think the keys for Connor, as always, is he's got to test that chin in round one, establish himself as the bigger striker early, but he's got to most importantly be able to make changes and adaptions and adjustments mid-fight because nobody's more well-rounded or battle-tested than Poirier. So for McGregor, I need foot movement. I need his own leg striking. I need jabbing high and low. I need a much, much more well-rounded game from what we saw the second fight. Yeah, speaking of that second fight, he won that second meeting by a second round knockout that was just back in January. So, Luke, what does Poirier need to do to win this one? I think the big key challenge for him is at least at first, you got to slow things down. I think this McGregor, not the one so much in January, but this version, there seems like he might come out with a little bit more of a sense of purpose and frankly, a little bit of urgency. He's not going to be built for the long haul anyway. When that guy wins, it's usually going to be inside the first three rounds. I think both fighters know that. So the key for Poirier here is, and you saw it in the first round of the second fight with that takedown, doing a couple other things just to slow the guy down a little bit and then begin to build on your offense later. And so that second detail besides slowing it down to me, you got to set traps for this guy. You know Conor McGregor's probably going to be employing a lot of forward pressure. Use that against him. He did successfully. This one Poirier did, not just against Conor the first time, but also Dan Hooker, the fight he had before that one that kind of earned him the spot. So he's used to that kind of striking under those conditions. I think if he does both of those, he has a very good chance of getting his hand raised. Poirier with 13 wins by, night, uh, by knockout. So we're... Interested to see how this one goes on Saturday night. So obviously that's the headliner, but we have plenty of the other big fights to be fired up about on Saturday. Also on the card, top welterweight contenders and Gilbert Burns and Stephen Thompson, their battle with a potential title shot on the line. So BC, give me some keys for Thompson. Look, Wonderboy Thompson is 38 years old, which is ancient for the welterweight division, only he hasn't shown those signs of slipping. So the key for Wonderboy with that karate-based style is always going to be his movement. You don't want to be a sitting duck against a well-rounded, now evolved striker in Gilbert Burns, who of course has made his bones and his name on the ground, but can knock you out, can get you out of there. He knocked down the champion Kamaru Usman before losing his title opportunity within the past year. Thompson's got to move be difficult, keep the fight on his script and his terms. And what that means for Thompson is always changing up his looks, his angles, his movement. You want to take as long of time for your opponent to figure you out and take that snapshot. When Wonder Boy's at his best and he's flowing, it's very difficult to figure out what he's going to do next. 38, not too old there, right? I mean, it, a little bit ancient for that world, but I it's, mean, it's old for me, okay? Yeah, you know, if I my agree. hair gel is dripping down post-prime Giuliani, you can at least tell me that out in this desert heat. You look good, you look good. We'll let you know, don't worry. Uh, Burns, he's 19 and four though, number two ranked welterweight contender. So Luke, what do we need to see from him? There's two sort of lines of thinking here. One is that he really has to corner Wonder Boy, go after his legs, at least at least establish a takedown threat, if not the takedown itself. Obviously on the ground, a guy like Gilbert Burns is going to have a significant advantage, but getting the fight there is going to be very difficult. But if you can make Wonder Boy think that the takedown could be there, that could disarm him a little bit. I actually tend to think, though, that that's a possibility. But I'm more likely to see maybe Gilbert Burns going a little bit of seesawing back and forth, putting pressure at times, and then getting actually Wonder Boy to walk to him. You don't see a lot of guys do that unless they're actually kind of hurt. But uh, fighters who have had success against Wonder Boy, in particular Anthony Pettis the last time out, when they let Wonder Boy approach him a little bit, it actually makes him a little bit more open for counter strikes, especially with somebody who's quick and explosive. That is exactly who Gilbert Burns is. So between Gilbert Burns having this great background with his coach and Henry Hooft with Thai kickboxing, which has been, I don't want to say something of a karate killer, but it has shown to be successful in certain monumental mixed martial arts occasions. Between that and also the ability to set traps later with his good athletic ability, it's a winnable fight for him. A tough fight, to be clear, but a winnable one. 
Let's talk about Greg Hardy for a bit. So the former NFL All-Pro, he's just four and three since making his UFC debut. BC, how much longer can the Greg Hardy experiment last? What do you think? Look, it's an interesting question, and one I asked to him at Wednesday's Media Day and sort of said, look, if you can lose this fight, you'd be 500 in the UFC. Would you still continue to get the high placement that you get with your celebrity name? Hardy was a little incredulous to that, said, look, I don't even care about the record. I know I'm improving every day. Here's the positives for Greg Hardy. A plus explosive athlete with knockout power, and he's only 32 years old. So what he's actually done in three years since joining the UFC is pretty remarkable. He's been very active. He's grown at a, at a steady progression. But he hasn't gotten over that hump, though, to show you that he's a true uh, – I don't want to say elite because that's a long way off, but gives you the sense that he could one day win a championship and be a legitimate contender. The age at 32 is key because heavyweights age later. You don't need speed as much. He's very explosive, but there are some big gaps in his game, including his gas tank, his ability on the ground. He's a very confident individual. He's accomplished a lot in sports, obviously, beyond the octagon. But I do think for the placement he gets, especially the featured bouts on the pay-per-view events, he's going to have to start winning big time. And I would also add, in addition to everything BC said, his game is very lopsided. So if you watch him on the feet, and yes, all fights start on the feet, so that's that's it to his advantage. He's got pretty good stand-up, actually. For all the reasons BC cited, his ground game has been not good, abysmal, frankly. And his last fight had really kind of cost him. He just fell apart the instant the fight hit the ground. Cardio has also been a bit of a challenge for him. So in this fight, he's really got to show a little bit more well-roundedness, and he's got to show some cardiovascular conditioning. Yeah, he really will be able to make a sizable leap forward if he does win this fight. All right, Luke, uh, let's talk about the ladies for a sec. What should we expect for the Aldana fight? Both of these women really trying to get into the women's bantamweight title contention there. I would say that Yana Kunitskaya is going to mix it up a lot more than Irene Aldana. Aldana is a, a boxer at heart. I mean, obviously, she's a mixed martial arts fighter, but she's got a tremendous jab, and she builds a lot of her offense behind it. You'll actually see fighters in MMA, they've got good abilities, but they don't really put anything else behind it. It's just sort of a one-off, or it happens on occasion. You always wonder, why don't you do more with it? Aldana has a phenomenal jab, a phenomenal boxing game, great footwork. She's also battle-tested as well. I think you're going to really see her try and stick and move. Kunitskaya, on the other hand, I think is going to want to either play a kickboxing range to a degree, but probably not even that. I think she's going to want to get on top, hammer Aldana from on top with a great ground and pound. She does have some of that, but it's going to be a bit of a tall order. Aldana actually also has pretty good takedown defense, especially along the fence line. I'm looking to see who can impose their will and under those conditions. Last Let's not enough. forget here, this is a quad. This is a quasi number one contender fight. This has never been a deep division post Ronda Rousey. Amanda Nunes has cleaned it out seemingly multiple times. The winner in this one could be a very big opportunity coming forward. Can't wait to watch it. And we're going to talk about one more fight before I let you guys go. I know it's hot out there. So Sean O'Malley, he was originally scheduled to fight Smoka, but he withdrew on June 28th due to a staph infection. So now he's getting the newcomer. I want to ask both of you about this one. It seems like O'Malley should roll here, but he's getting criticized for his opponent. So BC, what are your thoughts with this? You know, he talked about that at Wednesday's press conference, a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. He gets great placement on this Conor McGregor card, but not against the opponent that we expect to challenge him in Moutinho, making his UFC debut, although to his credit, the guy who's trying to come in as flashy is Sugar Sean with the dyed, uh, you know, neon green hair and also has predicted this will be your fight of the night, regardless of winning and losing. But for Sean O'Malley, it's more about putting that loss to Marlon Vera in the, in the rearview mirror. That wasn't his finest moment. He had an injury. Some people thought maybe uh, he didn't react well to his first defeat in the UFC. O'Malley long-term is such big star potential. He's a knockout threat. He's dynamic in there. I think just being on this card with this many eyes and having this, the platform to possibly deliver another highlight reel knockout, that's going to be big for his confidence and even more for his brand moving forward. And I'll say Sean O'Malley has been the subject of criticism that BC has alluded to. Not all of it unfair, to be quite frank, but this time I feel like people are really just looking for something that's not there. He's the one who showed up without any kind of injury issue. He's the one ready to fight. Presumably he'll make weight. They gave him a list of opponents. He accepted all of them. He didn't turn anyone down. In fact, he picked the hardest guy on the list. And then that guy came back and said he couldn't make weight. And that's fine. It's a short notice. I don't blame him for not being ready to make that 135 limit. But asking Sean O'Malley to take an opponent on short notice and go out of your weight class, come on, folks. This is high-level fighting. You're, if you want to criticize Sean O'Malley for some of his excesses and things he said about opponents in a disparaging way, fine. You can do that. But this time, he's blame-free. And his hair. You can criticize that. And the hair is also kind of weird.
I'm also a little upset that we didn't talk about hipsters today, but you know, well, there's the rest of the week for that. So fellas, thank you <laughs> so much. There's plenty of time. <laughs> we'll get you out of the sunshine right now. If you want more from these two, you gotta check out the Morning Combat podcast. Morning Combat, it'll be live from Bet MGM Sportsbook Bar and Park MGM this week in Las Vegas. Latest pod going in depth with the five biggest questions heading into UFC 264. If you love combat sports, subscribe so you don't miss an episode.